for the last 30 days, I've been living by Miyamoto Musashi's 21 precepts in his final work, Dokodo, A Code for Life. And in this video, I break down the impact these 21 rules have had on my life and how they can help you. Miyamoto Musashi was a famous swordsman who roamed feudal Japan between 1584 and 1645. He was famous for winning 61 duels, which I'm assuming were mostly to the death. In his later years, he became a strategist, a writer, and a painter. Musashi was a ronin, which means a wanderer or a drifter, a person of the waves, a samurai with no master. He simply roamed feudal Japan with two swords, looking to improve himself through combat. So he knows a thing or two about the warrior mindset, the warrior mentality, which is what I want to dive into in this video. So why am I making this video on Dokodo? Well, I am 41 years old, I am divorced, single, and I am making a career change at the moment. I'm a few years into changing from being a lawyer into a full-time creative. I also teach movement, and I sat down recently and I thought, right, what are the rules I want to live by to create the most epic life I can with the least amount of distractions to achieve my goals in the shortest time frame possible and enjoy myself. And I came across Dokodo and I thought, well, Musashi's been sitting in a cave meditating on this back in the 1600s and he's already written it down here for me. So why don't I just try this guy's rules and see how they go? Something to bear in mind when we go through these 21 precepts is Musashi never married, he never had kids, he never had too many long-term relationships as far as I could tell from the research, he never stayed anywhere for too long. He left home at 13, didn't get along very well with his family, and most of his relationships were with disciples who had to obey his orders. So if you handed him to a modern day psychologist, they'd probably say he's a psychopath. However, he did manage to master multiple fields through intense focus. So that's what I'm looking at here in terms of context. How can we take his philosophy and these rules and apply it to our own lives, but with loving awareness? Accept everything just as it is. How can anything be any other way? As Eckhart Tolle teaches, there is only the present moment. The past and the future are but illusions. We are perpetually stuck in this thing called the present moment. So as much as we want reality to be different, no amount of resisting how things actually are is helpful. So the sooner we can come to terms with our reality and accept it, it doesn't mean we have to agree with what's going on, but accepting it means we're in a position of equilibrium. And then from there, we can act. I am a recovering alcoholic. Years ago, I had a very serious addiction to alcohol. I was in denial about it for many years. It got worse and worse until one day I caused an accident that could have really injured or even worse killed my wife and children. It was humiliating, it was embarrassing, and it was the rock bottom moment I needed to look myself in the mirror and realize I had a problem. And that was the day I accepted my addiction. I didn't like it. I didn't like what I saw, but that was the truth. I couldn't go without this stuff and in excess. So that was the start of my recovery, which was a beautiful process, really very difficult, but it's what I needed for my health and for my family and everything got better from there. My life did turn around as hard as that process was, and it all started from acceptance. So I've had periods of sobriety, long periods. I've never uh, fallen off the wagon again and, and gone back to that alcoholism addiction. But what I like to do now is enjoy alcohol sometimes in light moderation. And I like to flex my discipline a few times a year. I'll just go for a month, right? No liquor. And I know I'm in control of it. And that makes me feel good. That discipline, I sleep better. I train better. Everything else goes better for me anyway. But it's just good that I know I'm in control of it and I can flex that discipline muscle, which also empowers me. This one is relevant more than ever in a screen scrolling culture where we're just getting that dopamine hit whenever we want it. We're in this HD world, there's HD pornography. We can have a wank whenever we want to, whatever nationality girl you want in HD 
porn, or if you're a girl, maybe you're wanking to guys, I don't know, but it's all around us, or it's just TikTok or Instagram, or there's just instant gratification everywhere for that pleasure-seeking dopamine hit. We have processed food, we have liquor, we have basically anything we want at the click of a button on eBay or Amazon and click, 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 you know, dopamine, dopamine, whatever we want. So we need to have some discipline around this. And I think what he means here is don't just let that dopamine run your life. What we actually need is some discipline and some structure around how we organize our day. And there's nothing wrong with pleasure innately. In fact, it's very good, but we have to be very careful at managing where this pleasure comes from. If it's not a hell yes, it's a simple no thank you. And I have broken this rule so many times in my life and I've regretted it. I, as a lawyer, I remember I'd get offered these jobs and I knew they weren't right, but the opportunity to make some money was there when I ran my own business. And so I would reluctantly agree to them. And then three months later, I'd be thinking, how did I get into this mess? It would end up costing me more than the job was worth because I'm involved in low value people, unethical people. And I think now I'm tangled up in this mess and it will come back to bite me. It also happens in relationships. Maybe you meet someone new and you enter into that and it's not quite right. Maybe your heart isn't quite there, but your brain is like, no, no, I can make it work. Let's bend ourselves around this to make it good. And it does, and it goes on and on and on. Everybody gets hurt, hearts get broken. It's just not how you should do things. So whether it's career, relationships, everything you do, the style of training you like, you have to love it, go all in or not at all. I love this one and to demonstrate how much I agree with it, here's a little clip that I just put out on social media about two things I love. One, I'm very serious about my movement practice and two, I love to have a laugh. It's important that we can laugh at ourselves and feel that joy inside about just how ridiculous and how absurd it is that we're even on this floating ball of magma covered in water, traveling through space in an infinite expansion of nothingness. This one's a bit of a doozy because I can see how on one hand, on one level, that desire could be some sort of force that you want to pursue and it leads your life and it takes you in various directions and you feel like honoring it. But I think the type of desire Musashi is talking about, and remember he says, don't have no desire at all. I think that's impossible, frankly, because we're human beings. We will desire things. He's just saying, don't depend on it. And I look at a lot of decisions that have crushed me, like the heartbreak of a separation or when my children moved away from me and I didn't have them under the same roof as me anymore. These things that I desired so badly or a sort of career that I really wanted to turn out. I really wanted the lawyer thing to be great and solve all my problems and give me this tremendous inner satisfaction, but it didn't. And then a lot of breaking away from that is letting go of that desire for these things to fix me. So I think that's what he's getting at. It's this non-attachment, which is very deep in the Buddhist scriptures, which is to let go of our desires. I think it's okay to have them, but not let them crush us and dictate our lives. Do not regret what you have done. Wow. Okay. This is where we can start to confuse Masashi for a psychopath. And remember, you know, he, he may well have been. He's sitting in a cave in the 1600s after killing 61 men. Um, but I think, I want to think that what he means by this is what's in the past is in the past. Is it going to do us any good to sit here and regret and let it destroy us 
for our future years. I don't think so. I think we can learn from it. He's not saying don't learn from it. So I think what he's saying here is learn from your past, but don't regret it. Don't let it eat you up inside. What's done is done. Okay, we need to move forward. We're going forward. Here we go. Let's go. You coming with me? Let's go. Never be jealous. <laughs> Easier said than done, Musashi. Okay, I think I've definitely messed this one up, but it doesn't serve me. It's never helped. Whenever I've got jealous, I remember one time I broke up with a girl that I loved. And then a few months later, I was down the street. I went into a bar and I saw her on a date with this guy and it, it crushed me. It crushed me. And I don't know how you stop that feeling because the jealousy is just intense. It's an intense feeling, but I'd love to not feel that. I don't know how you like remove that from your emotional center. And I think if you didn't have that kind of emotional response, which sometimes probably is appropriate, you may well, well very well be a psycho. So, but I think it's still something that we can aim for and practice. And when I was able to go home and like rationally try to unpack that feeling, it's like, but well, you just want that person you love to be happy. They're out having a good time. It doesn't really affect you. Like you're free to still live life on your terms. Let's focus back in on your life. Okay, what are you doing today? Um, what are you doing tomorrow and in the future? Let's plan your life out. Don't sit there thinking about someone else's life and how they got it better than you. Let's focus on your life. Let's write down your goals and let's move forward. Never let yourself be saddened by a separation. Okay, no one said that these precepts were gonna be easy. Now, the first person I lost was my grandmother who I was very, very close to. And that was the first big death I really had to process and try to come to terms with. And I remember initially there was this very inten intense period of sadness. And then I would often dream of her. And then one night I had this beautiful dream where where they lived, they lived on this river and there was a jetty or a, like a wharf that went out to the water. And in this dream, I was a little boy and I was out on the end of this jetty and a boat came and my grandma and my grandfather, um, who later passed as well, were, was on this boat and they were dressed up in these beautiful suits, just like a photo that I remember seeing them when they were younger on the wall of their house. And in this dream, they hugged me and said goodbye to me. And then they sailed off into the mist and disappeared into the mist. And it was this beautiful like farewell in my dream and in the astral. And when I woke up, I was very sad and I was crying and it was very emotional, but it felt like I could let her go. And then I had this beautiful peace and our relationship evolved, even though she isn't in physical form anymore, I still could feel her presence. Now, you don't have to be religious or overly spiritual to understand this. When you've loved somebody and they've truly loved you and cared for you and had a beautiful impact on your life as a shepherd in this world or as a guide or someone who's just looked out for you, they leave an imprint. Now, a part of them is in you and you then live by some of their code. Now, there's no sadness anymore in this. It does take time, I think, to get to this, this point, but whether it's a relationship breakup or you, uh, someone dies or maybe it's a pet, um, there will be an initial sadness and some grief. But I think with time and just processing and allowing those um, emotions to occur naturally, we can process that grief and then get to a place where the relationship almost continues, even though these people aren't in our lives anymore. When I owned my law firm, I had this beautiful woman working for me as my secretary and my personal assistant. And we created this rule because we were trying to stamp out negativity and complaining because we both recognized from time to time we'd each indulge. And so we came up with this rule where if I was doing it, she had permission to say to me, hey, Aaron, you know what you sound like right now? And I'd say, what? And she'd say, you sound like a little bitch. And then that would just like snap my ego so hard. Often it'd make me furious, but it'd catch me out and be like, oh gosh, I'm complaining and being negative. I'm ruining my day and yours. I'm infecting and polluting this area. So, and in turn, she would let me do it to her. And so 
In the end, it got to the point where we didn't even have to finish that sentence. So if you do find that sexist or derogatory, then eventually all you have to say is, hey, you know what you sound like right now? And if you've already got that dialogue, they know. They're like, oh gosh. So this is just something that you can do with a friend, but essentially like, what's the point? What's the point being resentful, negative, complaining? We need to focus on solutions and moving forward. Let's deal with lust first. That's easy because I think we've all done things out of lust. Maybe you slept with someone that you didn't really have strong emotional feelings for. You knew it was a bad idea and that never ends well. Maybe you had lust for power. So you made calculating decisions just for power's sake. And it's not something that truly came from your soul. Um, so lust, we can just rule out. That makes sense. Now, love. Wow. Wow. This is a tough one. Do not let yourself be guided by the feeling of love. And I try to think, what did he mean? Because I think surely he can't mean don't love anybody. I, I, you know, he never married according to the research and he never had children or anything like this. I think what we need to look at is this idea of non-attachment. So I think what it means is that you can still do life, but not be attached to outcomes. That's how I'm choosing to take this one. Now, you don't have to agree with all of these precepts either. You could just go, that's dumb. I'm, I'll take the other 20 or I'll take 17 and I'll discard that one. This one's challenged me the most, but I challenge your thinking here to think about what did he mean? And I all I can come up with is that it's this non-attachment feeling that it's okay to forge relationships and connect with life and things in life and let your heart and soul guide you, but then don't be attached. When things go, just like I mentioned my grandma left, I can't let that crush me. I can't let that love destroy me. Does that make sense? Don't let love destroy you. I think it's okay to have love, but not if it destroys you. This one could be confusing as well. A lot of them are because they're they're riddles in a sense. Each one has a riddle of its own to unpack. But I think here, what we're talking about is like inequality. And when we look at things like racism, discrimination, it's this heightened sense of separation where we're trying to like segregate humans and go, no, you're of lesser value because your skin color is like that. And you're of higher value because you're this color, which is just insane. It's just this construct that human beings try to put onto humanity and the way we see the world when in actual fact, all humans are equal. You know, why should we have a preference whether you're black, yellow, white, red, whatever? We're all humans. We should all love each other. Be indifferent to where you live. Now, again, I think it's not that you shouldn't have some luxury, some comfort. I think what he means is be able to be happy in anything. You should be able to be in a tent and be happy, be grateful for the nature around you or the trees outside your door, or you're in the Hilton penthouse suite and you can still enjoy that. It doesn't matter. It's not saying renounce wealth, renounce luxury. It's just saying be happy that you have a roof over your head. Be happy with what you have. Do not pursue the taste of good food. This one's going to upset a few people. Now, I'm no Anthony Bourdain or Gordon Ramsay. I'm Aaron, and I've been on a diet for the last 30 days, applying these protocols to my life. I adopted an animal-based eating system because it's food that I just generally like, but there were days where it was getting pretty repetitive because I'm eating more or less the same sorts of things every meal. I'd intermittent fast until lunch, I'd have meat and fruit and some honey, some avocado, and then I'd have the same thing for dinner and just drink some water. And I, I have to say it got a bit repetitive, but it was nice because it brought me closer to my goals. My training went better. I lost a bit of that Christmas pudding weight that I put on over Chrissy. So I trimmed down, I got leaner, I got stronger. My training went better, I slept better, I feel better. My energy levels are higher, I'm more creative. My cognition feels better. So. There's value in sticking to that rather than letting my taste buds and my dopamine response just guide me towards the sugary ice creams and chocolates and, you know, sweets and processed foods.
Part of this process for me has been cleaning out the garage and my house. I've been compiling anything I'm not using. I've been selling it. I've been putting it on to Facebook Marketplace and just selling stuff bit by bit. And I've got to say, it's very liberating. It's kind of like spring cleaning energetically. I feel like um, I'm becoming lighter because I don't have all this old stuff in my closet. It's all going and all even my old undies that I didn't wear or a bit scungy throw them out and I just got stuff that I actually use and wear and it feels more efficient, it's a bit more minimalist, I'm, I'm not as cluttered and it's just all around a better way to live. Do not act following customary beliefs. Now, this one could ruffle a few feathers because I do see a place for tradition, I really do. However, what I think Musashi means is be prepared to be progressive and evolve and adapt to the day. It's Darwinian theory, right? It's not the strongest or the fittest that survives. It's that which is most willing to adapt. If I held on to these customary beliefs that were put into me through the traditional education system, when I grew up, the internet was just coming in. It was just new. There weren't any opportunities in it. So we were taught to go to law school like I did and get a white collar job. This was the safe, secure route that would make you lots of money. You had to go to uni for five, six years, then do master's degrees, more study. Then you had to work your way up through the ranks, make associate, senior associate, partner. Then in 20 years, you haven't seen your family because you've been working nonstop. You might finally get a Porsche and get rewarded with riches. That's all different now. If I held on to that belief, I wouldn't be here right now looking at you, possibly on the other side of the world, looking at me sitting here in my bedroom in Australia, reaching you on the other side of the planet and then potentially sharing my business with you. So these are all new values and I have to be prepared to learn the internet, learn technology, learn these new things and embrace them. And if I held on to that old mentality, yes, it's one pathway, but it's not the only way. Now there's all this opportunity and fresh entrepreneurial possibility. So I think that's what Musashi means. What I think he means by this is, I mean, he's sitting around with swords, right? But I'm sure they were coming up with new weapons. Hey, look at this bomby knocker or look at this crazy knife with this other little stabby bit on the end. And he'd be like, Oof. You don't need that. You just need this blade and this blade and that's all I need to be effective at my goal, which is defeating another man in a duel. Now, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to reach you and impart this wisdom from Musashi through this camera to you through the internet on the other side of the world. What, I, what do I need to do that? I simply need uh, a phone to record myself on. I don't need crazy amounts of gear. I've just got to keep it simple. And I think it's easy to think, oh, if only I had a studio, if only I had more equipment, if I had a better computer, oh, if I was more handsome or if I had a cooler haircut, if a nicer shirt, maybe better production, you know, all of this stuff would start to overwhelm me when really it's just the basics. Can you hear me okay? Can you see me okay? Do I look reasonably well presented? I don't know, just... Keep it simple, keep it to the basics. Don't overcomplicate things with stuff you don't need. Easier said than done for a lot of people. I know it's up there. I think the number one fear for people is public speaking, believe it or not. And the theory is there that we are biologically derived from people who you'd have to plead for your life in front of a crowd. And that's where the fear comes from. Because if you got that speech wrong, if you didn't convince people why you're a good guy, you get crucified. So we have this pathological fear. There's a theory that it's that terror is biological. It's infused in our neurology. But um, to manage the fear of death for me, a few things. Meditation. Meditation is so helpful because I really feel like it takes me beyond this reality of just my ego and the literal world that I see. And when I sit and I calm down, I'm an advocate for transcendental meditation, but any style will do. And you find this piece of an observational position, watching yourself almost from the third person and watching your thoughts. And you realize I could be this essence behind the ego behind this personality, this Aaron man with this name that I've been given and this identity, oh, I'm an Australian white male, but really behind that, I'm this 
spiritual being watching it all happen. And through meditation, you can extract yourself from that position. This brings a certain amount of peace and calm uh, to me. I'll leave a link to the Transcendental Meditation page below if you want to check that out. It's an easy style to get into and start with. It's a mantra-based style, but you could do guided. You could do whatever you want. There's other pathways. There's religion, if that calls to you. There's atheism. Maybe it just is helpful for you to be like, ah, there's nothing. There's no afterlife. There's no God. And that makes me feel happy. If that's you, go for that. There's the psychedelics. Um, I've had some experience with that myself, perhaps the subject of another video. That's also very helpful for getting yourself out of your own ego and into this other dimension. Um, very powerful. You have to do it with like trained shaman, trained professionals because, you know, there are risks involved. So be careful if that is your route. But hey, religious, religion can be dangerous too. Look at what that does. You've just got to find what works for you. Meditation is a great place to start. Do not seek to possess possessions or faiths for your old age. Faiths. I had to Google that one, I'm afraid, because, yeah, some of the language has obviously been lost since the 1600s, and apparently it means land. So what he's saying is, when you get old, I mean, the, the end is nigh. The end is, uh, it's close, right? So what do you need stuff for at that point? You don't need um, to, to own things anymore. And I had this feeling today. I own this house and this land where I was. And yesterday I went for a walk um, in a forest that backed onto where my parents used to own uh, their, their land. And so I remember walking past and I was like, wow, this used to be my old house, like where my mum and dad lived. And that was my my land. And then I got thinking, oh, they don't own it anymore. And then I thought about my place that I own. Well, yes, I own it according to a piece of paper, a title, but I don't actually really own anything. Like when I leave, it'll be someone else's. And then when they leave, it'll be someone else's. And then if a meteorite hits the planet and we have an ice age, it doesn't belong to anyone. So it belongs to the earth. So what actually do we own ever? Even when we say we own things, we can, we can just like borrow stuff while we're here for a while and that's about it. So I think don't get attached to stuff. What's the point? What's the point in collecting stuff and clinging? It just brings suffering. So we need to just remember that um, we're kind of like all renting in a way. This one just embraces all gods, right? Um, Buddha was a man, a prince who lived in India and he went on to become enlightened. So we know him as a human. And I think the appeal of Buddhism is there's no real requirement to believe in this like higher mystical force. Like in Christianity, we have, you know, traditionally it's the man with the beard in the sky that uh, this, this other being beyond us that it's a bit of a leap in faith, and that's why they call it faith, because you've got to be prepared to believe in this greater force. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I think there is definitely, when I'm tuning into it, some sort of universal energy, but maybe it is a frequency, an energy, a feeling, I don't know. But um, I, I'm very fascinated by the life of Buddha, and I think to renounce wealth, renounce uh, his kingdom, and go into poverty and beg and then sit under a tree and become enlightened and free of suffering and then help so many other people liberate from their suffering. What a great man. Thank you, Buddha. And I think what he's saying is that we have to become our own Buddha. So we have to, yes, um, look at these pathways and, and pray like, please, if there is a greater force, help me and believe. But um, trust yourself and believe in yourself and know that this is me that has to do this life. I have to take these steps. When I was a kid, my favorite movie growing up was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So it was a cartoon and they made this epic Hollywood movie about it. And at the end, there's this fight scene. The final fight is between Splinter, the big rat, and he was a Japanese guy once, but you know, he got radioactive chemicals and turned into a rat. And he's fighting the Shredder, whose real name was Hamato Yoshi. And they're having this battle and Splinter has him hanging off the edge of a building. And he says, death comes to us all, Hamato Yoshi, but for you. And then Shredder tries to throw a dagger at him and he lets him go and he drops off the building. Splinter like catches the dagger and he, so, and he says, it comes without honor. 
And so in Japanese culture, honor is so important. And I don't know where we lost that in the West. I think maybe in the past, like we were more patriotic. I think there was a bit more honor. And somewhere through materialism and consumerism, we kind of lose that and it becomes this dopamine hit and this self narcissistic um, instant gratification culture. And this is something that we have to correct through discipline and through practice. And so for me, um, when I teach, when I teach movement, when I share my world, I never ask anybody to do anything that I haven't done myself or I wouldn't be prepared to do myself. And so everything I give to my students are things I can do or things that I would be prepared to do or have done. So this is honor and it's, it's practicing what you preach. It's, and it's having integrity to do what you say, follow through on your word. And this means more than anything. So I think he's right here. You should, you can abandon, even you think about abandoning your own body, how extreme that is for honor, because honor is everything without it. You can't sleep at night. This is the substance. This is the quality that lets you sleep comfortably at night because you trust yourself. You trust your own heart. In Taoism, the way is the middle or the effortless path. And when I'm teaching handstands, I like to use that example because in a handstand, the middle position is actually a resting place where we're stacking the joints on top of one another. And it's actually the place of least effort because you just kind of rest there uh, five degrees one side or the other. And it's a real struggle. Further than that, it's you're falling. And so the process of learning how to balance in handstand is one of adjustment. And through repetition, discipline, practice, focus, we can eventually learn to just rest there. And over time, we can build up to standing on our hands for over a minute, even longer, can take an absolute amateur. And within 12 months, I can teach you this. I can teach you how to balance in the middle. And this is a metaphor for life that Yes, life can be a struggle. Yes, we fall down. Yes, we make mistakes, but we learn and we make adjustments and we grow until eventually we can find this resting place in the middle where life is, is more easy. It's like resting. It's comfortable. And that takes focus, discipline, and practice. Living by these principles for the last 30 days has been excellent for my focus, for my discipline, for my energy. I've been productive, creative. They're not easy. They're not easy, but I think if we want a successful life that is productive and brings us closer to our goals without distraction, we're going to have to make a few sacrifices. And that means adopting these principles into our life and being strict on ourselves and getting support, having a coach, having some good friends that will keep you accountable, having some family, all these things really, really help. So I hope you got something out of this video. If you did, like it for me. Drop me a comment if you've got any questions. If you haven't yet subscribed, I'm doing a whole series on this self-improvement type stuff. So please subscribe, follow along, and I will see you in the next video.